And I'm alone. All right. Alone at last. <laughs> I've been enjoying following your uh uh your uh your peeler series on Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> I hoped it would be enjoyable to some people. It started out as just a, not a disagreement, but a, like, peeler wars between me and Yasmin, which is the best style. Well, I, th- <laughs> I think uh, you and I are on the same page as far as what the superior peeler is, so. All right. So, for the listeners, the, like, the stick peeler, I guess you would call it. Just like a single piece Versus of- Versus like a mandolin style. A mandolin. Okay. I think that's the word for it. Hmm. I've never heard that. I would have gone for wishbone peeler, maybe. It's like a V-shape with a blade. Uh, A mandolin might be a little more complex than what I was thinking. Yeah, so the mandolin peeler actually got more votes on my Instagram poll, but uh, only by a small margin. Well, when I voted, I was like the one person that voted for the... The more traditional style peeler, I guess is what I call it. Yeah. Yep. But it eventually made a comeback. <laughs> and then we had the peel off and the stick peel absolutely dominated. Although sample size is pretty small. <laughs> yeah. Was that, was that you and Yasmin? Doing yeah. The peel off? Uh-huh. Nice. You know what we should have done? We should have switched peelers so that both of us had a peeler that we weren't familiar with. Oh, and yeah. And then you're on the competition. There's an idea. See which one's the most intuitive peeler. Right. Hmm. Good morning. Good morning. Show number 49. Getting to big 5 Yeah. And to celebrate, what are we going to do? Any ideas? <laughs> <laughs> I think we should, should give away a pair of AirPods Pro. AirPods Pro. The latest and greatest mm-hmm. in AirPods. The, the newest product release from Apple. No, that's a 16-inch MacBook Pro. Never mind. Let's give away a 16-inch MacBook Pro. Pro. <laughs> <laughs> it's not in the budget. No. <laughs> All right. AirPods it is. AirPods Pro it is. All right. All right. Entry-wise, um, so we've got a subreddit now where we post all the shows. Uh, you can get two entries. No, it's one entry by leaving a... No, two entries by leaving a comment on... This show posts topic. So, find the subreddit, which is reddit.com slash r slash the r apple show. Um, It should be pretty easy to find. It should be the top one on the subreddit. Uh, Leave a comment there for two entries. Uh, Or alternatively, if you're not on Reddit for some reason, uh, you can have a look on Twitter. Uh, What's our Twitter account? It's just r apple show. Is that right? Uh, yeah, that's correct. Yeah, so just R, the letter R, Apple Show, uh, and retweet uh, this show's topic. So, show 49, leave a comment on Reddit for two entries or retweet the tweet announcing the competition and uh, this episode. And then we'll announce it next week, uh, next fortnight, next show. Yeah, just in time for the holidays. Perfect. And, of course, we'll post it uh, anywhere in the world. Well, David will post it anywhere in the world, so you do not have to be in anywhere North America. Th- oh, right. Yeah. Everyone's welcome to enter. All right. Any other caveats we need to add to that? Uh, do you have to be in a, a, I mean, a country that the USA can ship to? <laughs> I think there are some you right, can't. Right, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, there's like, I'm not a lawyer. There's like a bunch of legal jargon you're supposed to mumble at the end of giveaways, like, no purchase necessary to enter... Uh, excludes whatever California or something like that. I don't know, but I don't think we're big enough to get in trouble, so we don't have any legal stipulations. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't think so. And it depends which jurisdiction this uh, competition falls under. Maybe it's under Australian jurisdiction. So, yeah, which, whichever one is uh, is more lenient in terms of giveaways. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's the country that the winner's in. Who knows? Oh yeah. So cool. Anyway, nice little celebration for Big Five Zero, our birthday. Yeah, which lines up with the two year anniversary of the podcast. Right. Another big milestone. Yeah. I can't believe it's been that long already. It feels like we were just celebrating one year. Yeah, it does a bit. I, I keep track because it's roughly the same age as my son. So that, that's a bit easier to keep track of it. 
<laughs> but uh, both him aging and this show has just gone past in an instant. <laughs> yeah. So we can actually start looking back at predictions we made two years ago and see how accurate we were, hey? <laughs> so and you you seem to be pretty pretty accurate when it comes to those kind of things. Yeah, problem is I just forget what I've said, so luckily it's all on record. <laughs> so yeah, we need to I still really want to get into our, our past episodes and put together like a uh clip show kind of montage of highlights from the last couple of years. Yeah, that's a good idea. A lot of work. Because that's a lot of audio. Mm-hmm. Uh, roughly an hour times 50. Quick math says it's about 50 hours minimum, I would say. Early shows were less than an hour, but uh, it didn't take long to hit the hour. And now we're closer to one thirty every episode. Mm, yep. So. Hmm. Anyway, we've got a real mix of topics this show it's kind of all over the place <laughs> uh yeah yeah i got a lot of uh nothing no no really big news so just kind of a bunch of small things here and there something that i was missing though is any word of a mac pro um what are we yeah, expecting for the mac pro to be able to order it by now that i was anticipating it was going to come out in november uh, just, I know technically it's still fall, but when, when someone says something's coming out in fall, I, I kind of feel like November is the end of that time frame. Uh, uh, but Apple did say, uh, at least a couple weeks ago that it, it was definitely coming in December. So it doesn't seem like any timelines have been pushed, pushed out. Um, but yeah, you'd, you I guess the Mac pro isn't necessarily, something someone's going to be buying for like a holiday present. So they probably not have no rush to meet, like have it available for the holidays. Uh, so maybe they're still working out the last couple details about configurations and pricing and, and they just don't feel any rush to, to get it out in a timely manner as long as it's by the end of the year. Yeah. This time of year, people are normally a little more cash strapped with all the Christmas buying and that. So it seems the closer yeah, it gets to fair. Christmas, the worse it is. And yeah, and I don't expect anyone's buying it as a Christmas present except maybe the one percent. <laughs> uh, yeah, I I don't I don't know if the kind of budget that Mac, the audience that this Mac Pro is targeted towards, it it shouldn't it shouldn't be a dent in anyone's personal finances. This would be like a company purchase or something for a, a heavy duty computer like this. In my mind, I can't imagine anyone personally needing a computer this this powerful unless they're like working for a production company mm, yeah they probably want to get it done before businesses close up over christmas as well then who knows so it's fair so they said fall uh how do the seasons work for north america is it like a 30th of november cutoff and then you're into winter or do you have like the the more european sometime in the middle of the month uh yeah I think that I'm going more off of just a feeling like by the time you get to December, uh, it's really cold and snowing. And so it doesn't feel like what I would consider fall. Uh, but technically fall ends on December 21st. Oh, really late so, in the year. Okay. Mm-hmm. So we're already, already into summer cause it's just a end of the month cutoff. First of December, summer starts. Oh, really? Yeah. And it lined up really well, actually, this year, because we had like a week of 40 degrees and next week's going to be pretty much the same. I'm pretty sure that, yeah, our seasons are lined up with the solstice. So winter solstice is December 21st. Mm -hmm. So that's the, the first day of winter. But makes sense. Just harder to keep track of. <laughs> it's so uh, foreign to me for it to be this time of year and you talking about it being... 40 degrees <laughs> <laughs> that's 105 fahrenheit i just did the calculation yeah and it's it's uh well right now where i am it's currently zero c uh but it it started the the day uh almost 30 degrees fahrenheit colder i don't know how that translates to celsius but well in well into the negatives for you it started colder than zero and worked up to zero that's brutal. <laughs> yeah. 
so but that's pretty pretty average for where I am. The days start cold and then they they get pretty warm actually by the middle of the day and then they get back down to below zero. Warm in quotes or in real life warm? Uh let me do a quick uh quick conversion. I want to say this to you in a way that makes sense. It got up to 16C yesterday. Yeah, okay. It's pushing warm, just just kind of the bottom limit of what I consider warm. <laughs> well, I think we have different definitions because if it was around 16 year round, I would be very comfortable. But yeah. I think you're used to much warmer weather in general. <laughs> yeah, I think so. 16 daytime is about as cold as it gets winter. And, right. Yeah. But it is a very comfortable temperature as well because it's kind of fine to go outside with a lightish jacket. And and in my mind, once you get to 60 Fahrenheit or about 16 C is, is where you don't need a jacket anymore. Oh, you wouldn't even wear a jacket at that point. Okay. Uh, no. <laughs> so we had a, we had a, uh, that was actually our rule in school. I remember is, is every, every day before recess, we'd call, uh, we have like a local time and temperature number you'd call before the internet was really a thing. It, it would tell you the temperature in your area. And, uh, the rule was if it was above 60 Fahrenheit, you didn't have to wear a coat to recess. And so we'd call every day to see if we had to wear a coat to recess. <laughs> what happened to the good old thermometer on the wall, though? You know, I don't know. That would have been an easier solution. <laughs> I think I think we just... The time I remember, this was around like fourth grade. And I think it was just fun because every day one of us got a chance to dial the number in the phone. I think we just liked that. Yeah, that does sound pretty fun. For that age. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, a thermometer would have worked a lot better. Yeah, it might have been a little quicker. <laughs> um, kind of... Uh, yeah. I, I know we kind of already did the the beginning of the show hellos, but we would kind of then got back off topic and <laughs> random stuff. Uh, I got a Mac Pro today. Really? Cool. Okay. Yeah. Not not uh not a new one, obviously. Uh but not even not even a trash can. I got one of the old cheese graters. Okay. Yep. So, Which gen? So the last the the five comma one, so the last version of the cheese grater. Is that a G five? No, no. G five was the Power Max. Oh, okay. I'm way off. So so this is still Intel Xeon chips, mm-hmm. uh, but it came out in twenty ten. Um and it's, it was a really good deal. Got it for a hundred bucks. So, and if you put, I was looking to, if you put like $600 into it, it can still run the latest operating system and you can still get it. If you upgrade the Wi-Fi chip, you can still get handoff and uh, you can still get like unlock with the Apple watch and you can still put like the newest GPUs in it and you can get a like dual 12 core Xeons to slot in still and, and, and more Ram than I could ever need. So I thought maybe if I pick this up cause it's so cheap and it was local, uh, I can start throwing parts in it and maybe still use it as a usable primary computer, which is a real testament to the old Mac pro design that it's 10 years later. And I can still feel that way about it. I'm shocked that you can get things like handoff and uh, unlock with Apple watch and those sorts of features because they are very quick to drop off the old Macs. All those sorts of features are, uh, yeah, uh, right. Generally limited to like a couple of years. Uh, even looking at the uh, 2014 MacBook Air on my desk, that's already starting to lose some of those features. So very impressive. <laughs> well, the, okay. Yeah, the good thing about the Mac Pros, unlike the MacBook Air, is that if Apple has a feature that requires the newest version of Bluetooth, I can I can just put in a new Bluetooth card and mm-hmm. then suddenly it'll all work again. I think there's some finagling you have to do where you say don't check the the version number of the computer or something. Uh, but if you if you turn that off through the command line, then it has all the necessary hardware, so it'll work. Um, and I assume you're going to stick some solid state drives in there as well. Uh, it came with an Apple 500 gigabyte solid state drive, which really? I can't imagine. I can't imagine how much that cost in 2010. Probably thousands of dollars. Was that an available option SSD. in 2010? I can't even believe it. 
Yeah, it was because you could get a solid state drive in the MacBook Air at the same time. Yeah, that must have cost. Which was also a thousands of dollar upgrade. An extortionary amount of money. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, I, I mean, I don't, I'm sure the speeds of a 10 year old SSD aren't what a modern one would be, uh, but it's much faster than any, you know, uh, moving drive. Yeah, even the slowest SSD is going to have latency that destroys a hard drive and uh, probably read and write speeds that at least compare. Yeah, so I'm kind of excited to to see how usable I can can get this 10-year-old computer. Uh, Catalina is the very first version of macOS that isn't compatible with these Mac Pros. Uh, but you can kind of disable the same hardware check to get it to to install and run uh, as long as you have a GPU that supports metal. Uh, so I'll have to pick up one of those, but that shouldn't be more than maybe 100 bucks. And what plans do you have in mind for this little project? If I can get it running well enough to to like develop modern apps on, like using Swift UI, uh, I would be really happy. Like I'm sure it's not going to be as fast as any any modern iMac or or anything like that. But if it's if it's usable, I think I would count that as a as a win. Uh, but as far as what I'm going to do with it, I don't know. If you're running two dual core Xeons in there, it's probably going to compare in multi threaded performance to a lot of newer computers. I mean, it, I mean, dual core Xeons is probably even your uh, small thinking because this can do two twelve core Xeons. Oh, sorry, that's I mean, what I meant it. to say. If I didn't say uh, that, okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I think I tried to say dual twelve core Xeons. Maybe I missed out the twelve core part. Mm. Mm-hmm. So I think the biggest limitation is going to be in single core performance. Exactly. Um, yeah, because because single core can't compete at all with modern computers. And unfortunately, that's going to slow down most modern applications because still a lot of things only use one core. So it's kind of a handoff right now between do I keep this this four core Xeon I have now that runs at uh, like 3.5 gigahertz, which is respectable speed, or do I get something with more cores? So multi-threaded performance is great, but it goes down to like 2.7 gigahertz. So my single core performance is going to going to be pretty hurt yeah it really depends what you're going to be running um if it's xcode though that's that's multi-threaded right so i'll at least be making a step up maybe i'll grab like a six or eight core xeon and uh the cool thing is if you double the number of processors you can more than double the amount of ram it accepts too because it came with 16 gigs which is still a very usable amount of ram today uh but i could put easily like 64 gigabytes of ram in if i had the extra dim slots with that comes with the second cpu you've got big plans for this computer then 64 gig of ram <laughs> two 12 core xeons you're gonna have to uh raid some ssds as well yeah that would be too bad it's so easy to work on like there's not a single part that's actually screwed in uh I can just slide in and out hard drives. The whole CPU is on a separate tray that you can just unlock, unlock the tray and the whole tray slides out. You can slide in a new one with a new CPU. It's uh, crazy convenient. Uh, you're going to be uh, in a perfect position to compare to the new Mac Pro then when it comes out. <laughs> yeah. I was talking up the 2013 Mac Pro a couple months ago and the, the new Mac Pro was announced as maybe a good budget Mac for people, but... I'm going to take it a step back even farther and see if you can still make a, a 2010 Mac Pro work, I guess. Yeah, for sure. And there must be so many Mac Pros floating around on, like, the secondhand market. I've never checked, right. but I think there should be. Because I mean, I think yeah, mine was kind of an exception to get it for $100, but you can easily get one for two to $300 on eBay. So, so they're they're... Really affordable compared to what Apple's selling now. I doubt most of them come with a 500 gig solid state drive, though. That's fair. Yeah, this is probably a little special in that way. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm excited to see what you do with it. Yeah. Did I'll it come with the box? Back my results. No, it didn't have the box. Oh, damn it. <laughs> That'd be a big thing to keep around for, for 10 years. Yeah. Yeah, it's huge. <laughs> uh, so AirPlay 2 has been cracked. 
and will allow multi-room play to non-supported speakers. Um, Airplay 1 was cracked and actually proved to be pretty useful because all sorts of apps were using it for weird sort of edge cases. So it's cool to see the Airplay 2 as well. It's been cracked. Um, really? Which really, which part of the... <laughs> of that was- I, I, was, I wasn't aware that uh, there were applications taking advantage of a cracked Airplay 1 in the past. Yeah, yeah all sorts of things like um, bringing it to Windows computers to share the screen to the Apple TV and things like that. Hmm. And and how how close to Airplay 1 being cracked did Apple decide to release Airplay 2? Not straight away. I mean, it's been years and years since you could do all sorts of weird and wonderful things with Airplay 1 uh, before right. Airplay 2 came out. This is... It's exciting news for, for a specific community. I think we'll love this. I'm always scared to take advantage of of anything that's that's a crack or, or hacky because I would hate to to spend money on a on like a multi room setup that, that Apple can one day just patch out of working. It, uh, you you're the one that just told us about your Mac Pro which you're gonna like crack <laughs> to put Catalina on and then turn off this and that so it doesn't detect the it's got the wrong version of Bluetooth or whatever. <laughs> That's fair. Uh, <laughs> I, I spent very little money on that, though. And if I were to be mm-hmm. making a, a multi-room audio setup, I would want to make sure it's something that's going to last and not something that could be broken in the future. Yeah, I think things like multi-room audio tend to be finicky at best, although maybe I've just had bad experiences in the past with AirPlay 1. Um, no, I wouldn't want to introduce like weird factors like that are a bit out of my control and are not uh officially endorsed by the manufacturer right yeah i i've even been slow to adopt uh like smart home devices because i want them to be 100 percent home kit compatible before i pick them up even though there's things like like home bridge which would allow you to use non-home kit devices with home kit I just I don't want to rely on a on a third party to make all my devices work. I just want everything to work when I buy them. Yeah, this is a, a class of device like HomeKit things, um, wireless audio, wireless lights, smart lights, all that sort of thing. Where my philosophy is, if it's not like a hundred percent or at least ninety nine point nine percent reliable, then it's just too much of a hassle to, to come around because the technology that it's replacing is one hundred percent reliable, right? Like a light right. switch, you flick the light switch and the light goes on. Uh, and of course, having smart globes, for instance, for example, um, you do get a whole lot of extra functionality, but it's not so much that if it's like only 98% reliable, it's worth having around. I really need it to be like almost perfect <laughs> or even perfect. Yeah. I'm, I'm completely on the same page with that. I, I think we had a similar discussion with my my robot vacuum a few months ago. Right. <laughs> that as soon as I had to start fiddling with it, I just returned it. Um, and I'm actually experiencing, uh, now that it's been almost five years, uh, some of my smart light bulbs are dying. As in the, which the I, filament or whatever's in them is dying? Or, or what? The smart part uh, of it? <laughs> I've, ha- I've had a couple different failures, and I'm not sure exactly what's going on. Um one one light bulb uh, is in my my dining room. I have uh, kind of a small chandelier in the dining room that it's on a dimmer, which which is not ideal for smart bulbs. Uh, but it shouldn't be touched in an ideal situation. Uh, but with four kids, it gets played with all the time. Uh, wait, I wait! I just have to jump in and say, just put sticky tape over it. That's what I've done on all my light switches. <laughs> I mean, it's, a, it's a, like a knob. So I guess I could like tape tape the knob down. <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> Just go crazy. Yeah. Uh but I think maybe getting under voltage or something caused one of these to break. It's a very strange behavior. If if the lights are on uh because there's five bulbs in this chandelier. If lights are on, the one bulb that's broken will turn off. And it just won't work. But if you if you uh turn the bulbs off, uh that one bulb actually comes on. Mm, and it, right. it, it comes on at like less than 1% brightness, like just barely glowing. 
yeah, it's got to be some sort of voltage uh, supply thing to it, right? Right. And then I have one bulb that uh, I think it just completely died because, like, my phone can't find it anymore and I can't turn it on or off. Um, so I think five years is is probably a reasonable lifetime. It's like a couple bulbs out of the dozens I have have gone out after five years. doesn't seem too bad, especially compared to the lifetime of maybe a traditional light bulb. Uh, but when they're $15 a piece and that's the white ones, if it was a colored one that died, it'd be twice that much. Uh, it starts to make me question whether or not I want to stick another smart bulb in or not. <laughs> I'm trying to think how long I've had a smart bulb or how long I've had like the oldest one in my possession. And I think it's probably around five years. It's probably the oldest one I've got. Um, and I haven't had any deaths yet. No deaths in the family. Um, but yeah, I'm going to keep an eye out on it because I don't know, I think they're around at least three times the cost of a regular bulb uh, for like a Philips Hue um, setup. Right. I'm sure there are cheaper options around, but um, I've just stuck with Hue, keep them all the same. But ease of use. Yeah, and I know I know one is is abuse from the from the dimmer switch, so I, I'm not really blaming that one. Mm-hmm. And I've moved uh, four three times since I got my my bulbs, and so the one I have uh, is in my basement that died. It could have been one that I had left on my front porch for years before that. It could be my front porch bulb, so it could have gone through extreme temperatures for years, and it degraded it faster than the others and that could be why that one just died um so i don't i don't think i'm at a point of blaming the bulbs yet i think i'm leaning towards abuse right now Mm -hmm. so because i i kind of expect led bulbs to last longer than five years when a good halogen can last you know that long as well hmm yeah i've got no idea what uh bulbs are supposed to last but well to compare uh i'm renting this house and when I moved in and replaced all the light bulbs, apparently the previous tenant or the landlord, whoever replaced the light bulbs, uh, wrote the date you replaced light bulbs on all of them. <laughs> and the light, the light bulbs I had replaced said 2008 on them. They were halogen bulbs. So that's a good so, 10 years. Yeah. That's a decent, decent lifespan for sure. Although who knows, maybe yeah. the house was empty for five of them. <laughs> that's, that's fair too. They just never turned on. <laughs> yeah. So, um, anyway, anyway, back to the thread, (laughs) Mm -hmm. one thing I learned, I think I knew this, but, uh, brought back to my attention is that the airport expresses actually support, uh, airplay two, which is cool. So that's always an option for like, um, a more hacky or less hacky than running a raspberry Pi with cracked airplay two, but it is a, uh, kind of a workaround i guess to getting multi-room audio without buying like uh speakers or things with airplay 2 built into them so it's nice to have that option yeah i always liked the the airport express for that that line out i kind of wish the airport extremes had it too i never understood why they limited it only to their cheap routers yeah i think it might have been because they just pictured that the extremes uh, and the time capsules are going to be like away somewhere because uh, they have to be plugged right. into the router. Well, don't have to be, but normally the use cases they're plugged into the router and probably kind of hidden away. Whereas the expresses are like the the extension boxes all through that throughout the house. I don't know. I mean, I've definitely seen people use the expresses as their primary routers as well. Oh yeah, yeah for, for sure. For a small sized home. Or yeah, whatever. I've done that in the past. So that's a uh, fairly good deal. You could pick up a used Airport Express for for fairly cheap and and add AirPlay two to you know, any stereo system you have. Yeah. Yeah. It's a great deal. Again, we have to wonder why Apple isn't making these anymore, but I guess they, uh, they like to keep their product lines. (laughs) Sorry. To sell home pods, to sell home pods. That was the plan. Was it? I don't know. Probably. I, I still am of the opinion. I said this before the home pod was even officially released. They need to put a router in the home pod. I think that'd be perfect. Mm, I don't know about that because then you'd be limited to where you could place the HomePod. Uh, well, if you think of maybe the HomePod is more like an Express where it's a hub or an extender and not your main router. Mm. I guess at least being able to plug it in with Ethernet would be a little plus. 
then you wouldn't. Mm-hmm. You might have it like 0.1% more reliable because everyone knows that wired is always more reliable than wireless. Even today in 2019. Google just came out with that uh, this year with their home minis. You can can buy a pack. I think it's of three. And one is like a main router that goes in a closet or whatever. And you get two home minis that are uh, kind of like a mesh Wi-Fi system then. So they're your, your, your mesh nodes, but also have Google Assistant built in. All right. So is that why they've rebranded the Nest Mini, which is just the smart speaker, and now they have home minis, which are Wi-Fi hubs? Uh, let me get the name right. It might not be called the Home Mini. Uh, it's called Google Nest Wi-Fi. Okay. So, pretty cool idea. Um, and yeah, I wish Apple would would do this in a lot of ways. Have a, a smarter home assistant that's not... Or a smaller, cheaper version of their home assistant. Uh, so you can put them in more places. And then adding the, the mesh functionality in would be great. Because right now I'm depending on Google for my, my mesh home network. And I'd love to rope Apple back into the ecosystem. Yeah, I've recently added some, well, a um, Google Nest Mini to my kitchen. Kind of mm-hmm. sick of waiting for Apple to release a smaller version of the HomePod, um, but also not expecting it as well. And a um, a, uh, a rewards offer thing came up from my um, ISP to get some Nest Minis. So now I've got one of those in the kitchen again uh, after not having anything in there for a while. It's nice. It's nice. Uh, um, it sometimes talks to me in an Australian accent and sometimes in an American accent, which is a bit weird. <laughs> is that, does it respond with like whatever accent it thinks it hears? And sometimes it thinks you don't have an Australian accent? Mm, I'd be surprised because I couldn't do an American accent to save my life, as you're aware. So <laughs> I think it's just uh, the type of uh, response it's giving me. Uh, like some some of them haven't been coded or whatever into Australian English or maybe not recorded in Australian English. Mm. I don't know. Is it even recorded um, feedback it's giving or is it all just ge- uh, procedurally generated? Right. I I mean, think, I think how all smart assistants work at this point is like they have a, like a real person narrating like sample phonetics and then it's kind of pieced together. Uh, but I definitely don't know the details of that. Mm, yeah, no, I think I've heard similar. So, yeah, I love my Google Nest hub that I have in my bathroom. My, I have it uh, read me the weather and the news every morning while I'm taking my shower. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and I'd love it if Apple had something similar, but I don't know if we can ever expect something like that. I don't even know if we'll ever see a HomePod 2 or if Apple's gonna bow out of this market since the home pod wasn't much of a smash hit no so according to reports at least it was a bit of a flop um despite people who right. actually bought one seeming to love them and i do quite enjoy mine right yeah i have i have three home pods and i love all of them but i can't i <laughs> can't all of them equally or do you have a favorite <laughs> um i mean i guess i use my office one the most <laughs> i was kidding you don't have to all, pick one they're all great <laughs> Uh, but yeah, even still, I can't, even though I love them, I can't justify putting one in my bathroom. Uh, so I have the, the, the cheaper, uh, and kind of better suited nest hub in there. Uh, cause I don't have to worry quite as much about it getting damaged from humidity. It's not nearly as expensive. And then also the display is huge. Uh, cause you know, it's not just reading me the news. It's actually showing me a news report every morning and I can, I can see that and I can catch up on. Uh, when it tells me the weather, I can see the whole day, hour by hour. and So there's a lot of benefit to having a screen as well. Mm, okay. And also if there's, you've got loud showering in your ear. That's right. <laughs> uh, so Apple announces the first ever Apple Music Awards. I honestly didn't pay too close attention to this until they showed what the award looked like. Uh, and it's really a work of art. Um but besides yeah, that, I mean, cool. I'm seeing a lot of pictures of Billie Eilish. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, that's about the extent of my interest in this. Yeah, I, I'm i not sure why Apple felt the need to to do their own music awards. I kind of understood the 
the app awards they did uh earlier in the month uh because most like game awards don't don't respect mobile apps in any way and won't consider them for an award so i could see where apple felt like there's a niche to fill there and they could maybe highlight some of those mobile apps um but yeah we have so many music awards already i don't i don't really see why apple felt the need to do this except for the fact they're a streaming company now so they want to go all in Mm, they felt they had to maybe something like that i did learn a lot about Billie eilish as a result of this i guess okay what did you learn uh well first of all i didn't realize how young she is she's 17 Mm, yep quite young so and and been in the public spotlight for uh at least two years Mm -hmm. yeah maybe Um, longer so i i can't imagine being being 15 years old and and rubbing shoulders with with like drake and and the other big artists and that that seems uh and from what she said in some of the interviews i saw extremely overwhelming especially at that age so so i guess i i I don't know a lot about billy i don't listen to very many like modern songs but uh i grew a lot of respect for for her as an artist that i wouldn't have otherwise yeah her music's certainly catchy i've listened to the album a few times actually i think the album might even appear on my um my rewind list oh yeah yeah listen to it that much because we can talk about that later <laughs> well, i think that's one of the other yeah, topics we've got <laughs> um but yeah very so. young done an incredible job did you see the picture of her holding the award? Uh, I don't think I saw her holding the award, but I did see pictures of the awards. All right. Did you see pictures of anyone holding the awards? Because the individual photos of the awards do not give you a sense of scale that's appropriate for how big they are. Uh, no. I just saw whatever the stock image was that they posted of the awards by themselves. It's worth looking up. Because they're like over Let's a see. foot by a foot, I would say. Oh, really? Yeah. They are enormous. Maybe even bigger. Oh, I see. That's kind of blurry, but I can kind of get a sense for scale. That is a pretty big award. Huh. And this is a bunch of... of, uh, I mean, it's just a piece of metal with a bunch of Apple... uh, A wafer of Apple's silicone in it. Mm Mm-hmm. Yep. So... As someone in the thread, I can't see now, questioned, do you think it's uh, defective (laughs) or not? I mean, if if Apple was going to go to their CPU manufacturing plant, and and they had a pile of defective wafers and like give us some. I, I imagine they'd probably take them from that pile and not the pile of usable processors. <laughs> yeah, maybe. But there's also the principle of it. What if someone found out and then it got out? It would really devalue the awards. Yeah. What if someone you know wanted to to replace their CPU and their iPhone from their award and found out it didn't work? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Number one use case for the award. <laughs> so. Someone in the comments, uh, at least when this was initially posted, I don't know if it's still near the top, said, that, oh, yeah, it's one of the very first things. That this is a uniquely Apple award. And I guess it's uniquely Apple in the sense that it's their, their silicone in the award, but it's not very Apple-like at all to to show internal parts of their devices like this. They never highlight like what the insides look like or even the specs of the insides of their devices very much. So, oh no, no I would disagree with that. I think they do. They would often, like when a new MacBook's announced, they would often show inside the case and how, say, the thermal system works or that sort of thing. I suppose that's fair. Uh, but, but to that effect, if a new MacBook's released, they're going to say something along the lines of, it has a six core i7 in it. They're not going to ever say, like, what specific model number CPU they're putting in it or anything else. Mm-hmm. And they never say how much RAM goes in an iOS device or anything else. Mm. Uh, yeah, okay. Yeah, I see your point then. In this case, they're putting the chip front and center. Right. Which I, I think it looks good. I kind of miss the days of uh, clear cases. I kind of like seeing the inside of devices. Mm-hmm. So, but yeah, very cool. Uh, you briefly mentioned also that um, about the best apps of 2019. So that was also a thing since we last spoke. Man, a lot of the apps mm-hmm. I'd probably heard of, but 
only barely heard of. So the best apps of the year were Spectre Camera, Flow by Moleskina, Affinity Publisher, and The Explorers. Uh, actually, none of those I had heard of. Right. Yeah, I don't think I had heard of any of the, the top apps either. Uh, none of the games. Except for Spectre Camera. I had heard of, uh, except for the Apple Arcade game, which is Sayonara Wild Hearts. See, even that, I, I would have I would have bet that uh, that a uh, mini... Um, Mini Motorways was going to win the Apple Arcade game of the year. Uh, I guess it depends what categories. Maybe in terms of, of beauty or creativity, not. But I think that's the app I've heard the most about, just on Reddit and everywhere else. Mm, yeah. And they seem to have an, like an honorable mentions section titled The Storyteller Within, whatever that means. But uh, the Anchor app is in there. Oh, really? Yeah. I didn't see that. And it's a good app. That's cool. It is a good app. Yeah, it served us well. Uh, so. Any other comments on best of 2019? Uh, I think I'm out of touch. <laughs> <laughs> that I haven't heard of any of these apps. I feel like it too. Uh, although maybe Apple's criteria is has nothing to do with popularity. And it's like more in terms of beauty or creativity or something like that. And they really didn't look at download numbers. And it could have been a... A smaller app. Completely opposite of uh, the music award where it seems to be based 100% on how many plays someone got for the year. Right, yeah. yeah. But speaking of out of touch, our next topic. Uh, when Scott Forstall managed Mac OS X, Mac OS X, sorry, at the end of a <laughs> release, <laughs> everyone would get one month to work on whatever they wanted to. Out of it came a project that turned into Apple TV. Uh, and if you spend like two seconds looking at the comments, you'll find a lot of angry people telling us that it's a lie. There was no such month. And honestly, I could not believe that such a month would exist uh, in a busy company like Apple. Like an entire month to take off after a big release. Right. There's no way that happened, really. I mean, there might have been um, some sort of program that like if you stretch the truth might fit into that description but like a month after a major release uh, i i don't know i I think people would be locked in to fix all the bugs and problems and stuff that come out of that release Uh, there's no way everyone's getting a month off right yeah when this was first posted and there was like the top comment was saying that uh, forest all's a tool and, and this didn't happen, you know, that could be easy right off. But, but now that this is sat for a few days, there's a lot of people saying they were worked directly with forest or directly under him. And, and this is a lie. So it, it seems to be corroborated multiple times over. Uh, I could see something along the lines of, you know, I gave my developers like a couple days to do what they wanted. And then they pitched it to me, and if I liked it, I s- made a special team work on it for a month or something. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, I know at my company, uh, uh, ev- out of every two weeks, we have one day that we're allowed to work on whatever we want, and then and then twice a month we have like a, a three day long period, or not, not twice a month, twice a year we have a three day long period that we're allowed to to work on big projects. And we've had. Uh, some products come out of that in the past, um, which is, I think, pretty progressive for the smaller company that I work for. Um, I know I've heard Google does something similar as well, where they have, I think, maybe a week at a time where, where or I think it's more a percentage. Like, you're supposed to spend, like, 40% of your time working on non-work stuff or something. Yeah, I was going to bring that up. It used to be 20%, I'm fairly sure, for Google employees. Um, but it has been many, many years since I've heard that mentioned as like an active program at Google. Right. Yeah, I haven't heard anything about it recently either. So it seems like that's worked well. I think for Google especially, I've heard a lot of their projects have come, they used to brag about a lot of their projects coming out of that uh, kind of independent work time. Um, but maybe that's hard to sustain. Once you get to a point where you're so big, there's just there's just too much work <laughs> to have have people spending any time not doing whatever their core business value is. The comments uh, on the post on Reddit and the comments on the actual video on YouTube 
are a stark mm-hmm. contrast to each other. I'm not sure if you check the YouTube comments, but they are all extremely Scott Forstall. There's even a comment that said something like, uh, the failure of maps is a distant memory now. Scott Forstall's a genius, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> uh, whereas <laughs> I think 99% of the comments on Reddit are critical. So it's funny to see the different audiences. Yeah. Yeah, I, have, I didn't look at the YouTube comments. I'm just looking now, but that is very funny. Um, I know I'm I'm generally fairly pro Scott. I liked a lot of the work that came out of uh, Apple under his direction. Um, I don't I don't think that that Maps uh, is exactly the reason he got fired. And it was definitely more of a, a personality clash between him and Johnny, and and uh, maybe things have been really different with Scott. And I think if Steve was around, we'd still probably have Scott. Uh, but I, when was this talk? Was this a recent talk? I didn't actually look at what date this was. Um, yeah, I didn't check the date either, but I would guess it'd be pretty recent. Yeah, this was in October 2018. Um, I can see where I it being seven years after he left Apple as of this, this interview... Uh, him maybe embellishing some things uh, to talk himself up some more and, and maybe make it sound like, you know, his leadership and, and his, his uh, uh, managerial style is what resulted in, in some of the big things like Apple TV. Um, Cause I think we've looked this up in the past and Scott really hasn't gone on to do anything after Apple. No, I think he's producing some TV shows at the moment or something like that. Yeah. Nothing major. I mean, I mean, yeah, he's at a point. I'm I'm confident he's at a point financially where he has he has no need to go on to something else, and he could oh, sure. retire. And mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, but it's kind of like seeing Scott talk is is it kind of reminds me of of seeing Steve Wozniak talk. I don't know if you've seen any interviews of him in the last. I mean, even the last couple decades, but. You know, the, there's nothing new to talk about, so it's always like, "Tell us again about your time at Apple," mm. and that's that's all you ever you ever hear from me. You hear the same stories over and over again, and mm-hmm. and maybe they get more fantastical the more times they have to tell them. And <laughs> well, memory is unreliable, and I mean, there are heaps of tests that show how how suggestive memory is, and how uh, yeah, the further in the past it is, the more distorted it becomes. So. Um, yeah, maybe he does actually remember this month. Right. So, and this could have been a very real thing. Maybe this is like the higher level management got a month, the workshop new ideas and, and the, the actual developers underneath, uh, you know, they never got to, to see any time like that. So maybe there was like the official, uh, you have a month to do this, but the, the expectation underneath that no one would take it and that that would, uh, mm. just keep working. <laughs> As usual, business as usual. You have a month to do whatever you want, but you better want to keep doing your regular day work. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, like many offices I've worked in, uh, business ends at five. But if you leave before any of the senior management do, then you are not going to last very long. Oh, man. Yeah, having a culture like that is uh, uh, smothering to me. Uh, so Apple is expected to release 5.4 inch and 6.7 inch iPhones with thinner displays in 2020. Can you take me through this? I've kind of lost track of what size the current iPhones are in inch dimensions. So I don't know. Is this bigger uh, or smaller? So both. Because <laughs> <laughs> the iPhone 11 is 11 Pro is 5.8 inches and the 11 is 6.1 inches. And the 11 Pro Max is 6.5 inches. So they're they're talking about making a, both a bigger and smaller phone. Um, okay. Which I can't imagine going smaller than the current 11 without it just feeling like a baby phone. <laughs> yeah, but a lot of people do think, want smaller phones. Right. But they're also talking about the SE2 this, this uh, coming year, which is supposed to keep the same 4.7 inch form factor. So mm-hmm. I feel like that niche is kind of being filled already except for the niche of people that want face ID and a smaller phone, I guess. Uh, did you see also that the SE two is rumored to be called the iPhone nine? 
I did see that. I think I just saw that today. It's very unbelievable. I, I like it. I think it makes a lot of sense if you're going to make something in that same form factor, like kind of iterative of the eight, calling it the nine. Okay. But yeah. Yep. As, as a, as like a, someone who's, who's very into Apple products, I think it'd make a lot of sense, but any general consumer, if you release the iPhone 12 and the iPhone nine at the same time, that's going to sound ridiculous. Um, there's no way they can get away with selling a nine and saying, this is the new phone. It's faster than the 11 and the 10. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so just for, for branding reasons alone, I think SE two makes a lot more sense than, than a nine, even though I kind of would like to see them fill that gap and it makes sense in my mind. You're a completionist in a series. Hey, <laughs> yeah, I guess so. I'm still waiting for Windows 9, too. <laughs> I'm going to be waiting forever for that. Uh-huh. Um, but I'm I'm not sure how I feel about this. It's Man, recently, Ming-Chi Kuo is, has kind of been putting me off. I feel like recently they've been throwing just more and more at the wall and, and seeing what sticks. And they've been less... He's he, I think, Ming Chi Kuo, or is it even known? What do you mean? If anyway, it's, if it's a him, Ming Chi Kuo is is a is a a man, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. For some reason, in my mind, I thought maybe this was a a pseudonym, and we weren't sure. I know uh, it's a guy. Okay. It feels like recently he's been he's been in the last year at least throwing more at the wall and and seeing what sticks, and maybe this is more of. Apple's experimenting with a lot more stuff recently. And so it's really hard to nail down exactly what the final product is going to be. But to say they're going to release four phones this year, and then they're going to release another two, six months after that, another two, six months after that. And just, I, this doesn't sound real at all to me. And so I'm, I'm taking this with a pretty big grain of salt, even though this, specifics of this rumor here that we're talking about the 5.4 inch and 6.7 inch those sizes have been floating around for for probably the better part of a year now and the form factor is due for a complete redesign i mean there's talk of it following on from like an iphone 4 design um i guess similar to what the ipad current ipad pros look like as well so if they're going to be size changes this is the year or rather 2020 is the year yeah i'm i'm ready for something like that i hope that they go back to kind of a more boxy industrial design. I think that's the best way they could go with their designs. Mm. I just love the, uh, the current iPad Pros and the SE slash 5 slash 5S aesthetic. Uh, definitely mm-hmm. my favorite of all time. Um, just back on Ming-Chi Kuo briefly. I, I once uh, went through all his um, reports going back maybe two, three years. I think this was maybe 2017 I did it and then um, kind of looked at uh, which ones came true and which ones didn't. Uh, so maybe it's time to do uh, that again and just to see if he's improved in accuracy or not. Yeah. Yeah, I think maybe that'd be a, a worthwhile venture just to see because I feel like especially just this last year, there was a lot of things that that ended up... He, you could say he predicted accurately, but only because he, he contradicted himself from you know a couple months earlier or something. Mm, yeah. So, um, handily on Mac rumors, they actually have, um, like you can go to the source of this article and see all the articles from that source. Like you can click on Ming-Chi Kuo and then see every Mac rumors article that has reported really? using him as a source. So that's a very handy spot to go, um, to do some fact checking if you want. I mean, you just have to go back, say six to nine months, um, to really start seeing if old reports have come to fruition or not. Huh. I'm kind of worried if this form factor does end up being true. Because uh, like I said, the 5.4 inch would f- it feels a little too small or sounds at least a little too small in my mind. Um, but I specifically remember the iPhone 11 because I thought the, the Max was too big. And now they're talking about the big phone being even bigger than that. And so I don't know what I'm going to do uh, this next year if that ends up being the case. Uh, on this similar topic, there's also a report that the 2020 
Or is the 2021 iPhones aren't going to have a lightning port? So they're going to be portless. No headphone, uh, no yeah. lightning. Yeah, very specifically the 2021 and only the max sized phone in 2021. Like the. That seems silly to Trying me. Trying to come up with logic that would explain that is. is tough. <laughs> you really have to stretch to say that, well, the 2021 phone is going to be the same design as the 2020 phone. Uh, so there's that. And there's also, oh, it's only mm-hmm. the max that loses the port. In my mind, maybe it's because if you're forced to go with wireless charging only, you're going to do it in the phone that's bigger because it's a bigger battery. So the chance of it draining and you needing a fast charge are going to be much slimmer. So you never necessarily have to worry about battery life as much. It also, also takes longer to charge the bigger battery with wireless charging. That's fair. Or any charger. But also maybe the bigger space in this phone accommodates for maybe even a faster wattage of Qi charging. That for maybe heat reasons, you can't do it in the small one. Yeah, I hope we would see that um, coming anyway, regardless. Right. So, But I, it, it doesn't make sense to me either. Uh, to me, this kind of sounds like the rumors of iPhone. Do you remember the iPhone 7 Pro rumors that said it was going to have like a smart connector on it and all that? And uh it kind of sounds like that. They said there's going to be this premium tier phone that's going to have these extra features above and beyond all the other iPhones that never ended up happening. Mm-hmm. So the 2021 phone, Max phone, let's just say it has no port. It's yep. got to have some sort of electrical contacts. It just has to for diagnostics purposes. Right. Yeah. It still needs a port whether or not. It, yeah. So it's going to be um, along the lines of the smart connector, surely that we currently see on iPads where it's just uh, kind of exposed contacts. I I picture them taking a cue from the Apple Watch. Um, the Apple Watch's port is hidden under kind of a metal door. kind of looks like the SIM tray door. So maybe they have something like that where it's uh, kind of a hidden port. Maybe it's even in the SIM tray somehow. Hmm. And you take that out and you can plug into the diagnostic port. Might prove problematic if you're trying to troubleshoot something that's uh, to do with the SIM card slot. But apart from that, it seems like a pretty good solution. Yeah, Apple gets pretty creative about hiding their ports. Mm. Did you see that report uh, probably a month ago about how there's a, a lightning connector inside of the Ethernet jack on the 4K Apple TVs? Uh-huh, yeah, very, very, very <laughs> unusual. Yeah, so uh, I could see them coming up with something. But yeah, you can never fully abandon physical connection because if the device breaks you need some way to actually connect to it if the wireless is not working so i mean unless apple goes all out and you need to like open the phone to connect to it in some way Mm. and so you have to take it to an apple store and i mean you have to do that anyway whether or not the port is external so well remember how easy the back was to remove on the iphone 4 maybe in something along those lines be very surprised though I mean, it couldn't be that easy because of waterproofing. Yeah. Uh, but, but yeah, I'm sure if they had an easy way to get in and, you know, they could just stick a new seal on it when they close it up. And I could see that potentially being their way forward. The Verge is going to have an absolute meltdown if the lightning port's removed. <laughs> Imagine if they did something extremely clever. Like I'm looking at the back of my, my phone now. And I've got three metal rings on the back of my phone already circling the camera. What if they made some kind of special, like, magnetic adapter that went over the camera modules and used the metal around each three as a connection to, for diagnostic reasons? Well, you only need three contacts for a connection, I think. Uh, I think at the bare minimum, yeah. (laughs) Probably four is generally a safer number, but... Uh, the iPad talking about Pro's time of flight sensor. smart connector I just checked is three metal contacts on the oh, back. Oh, yeah. There Imagine you go. if it was the camera. Wow. Okay. <laughs> I think you've cracked it. All right. I'm, I guess I'm putting all my eggs in that basket. You're, then. <laughs> you're Steve Jobs on his deathbed. He's cracked it. Man, you know, now that now that Johnny Ive is gone, they should bring me in to design these. <laughs> 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 Any other aesthetics you've got in mind? Uh. 
Yeah, we need more notch. More notch. <laughs> I don't know. Why not just put a big bezel on the whole thing? Yeah, maybe maybe a like a button at the bottom of the display to take you home. Whoa. Speaking <laughs> of, there is still the rumor that pops up every month or two that these phones are also going to have dual biometric, so they're going to have un- under the screen touch ID and a face ID. Uh, we've already talked about this in the past, though, so we probably don't need right. to rehash it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'd be surprised if that was the case. But I am also surprised that these rumors keep circulating still. Man, December 2019, and we're already talking September 2020. <laughs> yeah. Um, finally, Apple Music introduces Replay, a playlist of your top songs of the year. So I remember for, I think last year, was it Mac Stories put out a shortcut which would compile your like replay of... 2018 i'm pretty sure that was last year well apple uh yeah i remember something like that apple sherlocked them so to speak even though mac stories <laughs> wasn't selling this shortcut or anything like that mm-hmm. um uh handily they've also uh what do you call it um like they've given us also our replays back from the start of apple music basically so i've got replays from 2015 through to 2019 which is nice to go back and see what I used to listen to. Uh, so apparently I used to listen to good music 2015 through 2018, and then 2019 is basically all Wiggles or other various kids' music. <laughs> so as soon as I saw that, I went and turned off um, listening history on the HomePod so that I wouldn't get that for my 2020 mix. Uh, I am in the same boat. My 2019 replay is all kids bop. Kids Bop. Uh, I guess I don't know. Do you, do you not have Kids Bop in Australia? I haven't heard of it. No, is that a band or a genre? Or? Uh, I guess you could call it a band. Kids Bop is where they take they take modern pop songs. They've been doing this since I was a kid because I think their current album is like album number forty. Um, and a couple times a year, uh, they take all the modern pop songs and they they clean them up. So they take all the explicit content out of them and put new lyrics in and they have uh this group of kids singers sing this new clean version of pop songs and they release a new album like twice a year or something uh so that kids can listen to pop music but kind of you know not be exposed to the explicit content hmm. so and it used to be like a a tv order thing i remember seeing commercials on tv to order kids pop like one and two uh but now it's you know digital downloads and streaming and and my kids love that. I'll have to check it out. I think mine might be a little <laughs> bit too young, but uh, yeah, maybe. So, uh, so that was your 2019 pretty, replay, then Kids Bop. It was Kids Bop, and then all the white noise tracks that Trini used to listen to before the HomePod <laughs> had it built in. What a replay! <laughs> uh huh. Um, but I didn't see it until you, you just mentioned it. They have the replays of the previous years. So, so yeah, I mean, four years ago, my music was a lot better. <laughs> so I actually had a lot of trouble getting my replay because, I mean, I saw the article that says, uh, like, click here to get your replay or something like um, replay.beta.apple.music, no, replay.beta.music.apple.com, which is a quite lengthy URL. And then it had me sign in on Safari and then had to do two-factor, of mm-hmm. course. And then it just said something like, uh-oh, try again. So, I thought, why don't I just go to the music app because I'm on an iOS device. Uh, and I looked everywhere mm-hmm. and could not find it. Um, and then uh, yeah. what did I do? It seems to be only in the browser. I think I just force quit the browser and then went back in. And then it worked the next time. And then once I added them to my library, then they appeared in the music app. But uh, I was a little bit perplexed as to why they weren't just front and center, say, in the For You section of the music app to begin with. <laughs> yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure why they chose to do this either. I didn't have the, the same error, but even without getting an error message, it's pretty convoluted to, to get in to Apple Music on the browser and sign in and do your two-factor and all that. Mm. So, but, hmm. It's also kind of telling how little I listen to music and, and even in my house, 
uses Apple Music. My number one track of, of 2019, which is the, the White Noise, has 33 plays. That's the most that got played. So, yeah, not too many then for you. Yeah, and then the rest, like the next nine in the list are Kids Bop, and those have like between 10 and 14 plays. And and when you get down to the very first song, it's actually something that I listen to. I got nine plays in a year. So I don't use my Apple Music very much. Yeah, it certainly sounds like it. Um, I'm <laughs> trying to see where you actually see those stats. I remember seeing them. I can see them for the 2019 replay, but not any of the others. But where exactly? I'm just looking. Oh, it's just right next to the name of the song. Hmm. Okay, I'm just clicking get replay again, see what it says. Um, mm. uh, all right, so we're looking at uh, row, row, row your boat with 74 plays on top. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, if you scroll down, then it gives you um, how many hours you've listened to it and such things as well. Okay, so I'm looking at 26 hours of Daniel Caesar, 25 hours of Radiohead, and 23 hours of The Wiggles. Nice. Uh, and actually, the second most album with 223 plays was When We Fall Asleep, Where Do We Go by Billie Eilish. Oh, wow. Followed by Parkway Drive, then Ramstein. Okay. My top albums are, uh, my number one album is Doc McStuffins. <laughs> okay. Uh, my number two album is White Noise. Uh, uh, my number favorite. three album, my number three album is Lion King soundtrack. Uh, my number four album is Meditation Stream. So uh, I have a very very boring listen history. <laughs> There's a lesson here to be learned. It's that listening history should be turned off on uh, family devices. Yeah, because I'd be really curious to hear what like just I listen to. <laughs> well, we'll come back to it in a year then, and. Uh, See where we are. All right. <laughs> All right. Talk to you in a year. <laughs> well, I'm James VDM on Reddit and Twitter. And I'm Jelly Woot on Reddit and Twitter. And don't forget to leave a comment on the subreddit post or retweet the show tweet uh, to enter the AirPods Pro competition. Uh, and I think on Twitter, make sure you have... If you do enter that way, make sure your direct messages are turned on so we can reach out to you if you win. Sounds good. Uh, Of course, winner will be announced next show.